things just so they get used to talking to you on camera. By the time we go on, they've warmed up, they're fine now. They're just like, oh, I'm just having a conversation. Um, so it does make quite a big difference. I think that's why so many of you are successful. That you literally consistently can give you two minutes before. And you calm, you're not rushing. And if you have any questions, you ask them and you test the sound and all those things. Um, I, I quite enjoy that. So the, um, makes people calmer and and they're able to show up because I think the reality is we wouldn't invite somebody if they're not an expert and I certainly don't want somebody's nerves to get into um, yep. them answering something I know they actually know and can answer. Um, so it's always great that they're calm and we get into the gist of the conversation. Um, and I always say just putting it's like us having a coffee and we're talking about property because essentially that's what it is. Um, even the viewers are very kind of laid back, they want to learn, they're quite eager to learn and know more. So yeah, I think when you look at it like that, it, it makes quite, it's quite a difference. Okay. Okay. Okay, cool. Hi, I'm Brian Kepper. I'm a 10 times South African motorcycling champion. My family and I have chosen to live in four ways. There's some really great suburbs in our neighborhood. There's a lot of families living in the surrounding areas in places like Lone Hill and Cedar Lakes. What draws people to Cedar Lakes is that it's so close to Broadacre Shopping Center Cedar Square and Four Ways Life Hospital. Lone Hill is a major draw card for many families. It's got some great smaller commercial centres and some fantastic schools like Crawford College. From an entertainment point of view, Monte Cassino really comes alive at night. There's so much on the go and there's an incredible energy in the area. Our family just loves the fast-paced lifestyle that Four Ways brings. But honestly, the thing that attracted us most to this area was the active lifestyle that it offers. As a family, we've chosen to live in Four Ways because of the lifestyle and convenience, and this is our neighborhood.
Good evening and welcome to episode 45 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantu Kumala. We've made it to Friday. I don't know if it still makes a difference whether or not we're, you know, Friday or Monday, because so many of us, of course, are spending our days at home. And I hope you are, of course, staying safe. Well, on this evening's edition of the Private Property Podcast, we're going to be speaking to the small-scale investors, because a lot of us, that's how we start off. You know, you buy that first investment property, or perhaps you buy two, and maybe if you're lucky, you're even able to scale it to three or more, but you get stuck and you're not quite sure how to move to the next step. We'll be looking at managing your property managing your property like a business tips for small scale investors and these are the tips that are going to be very useful for you to scale your property business and really understanding why you should be treating each property like a business as opposed to a side hustle and i know a lot of us probably you know accidentally get into the property market or accidentally buy that first rental property and never quite manage it like a proper like a proper business and don't quite understand why it's important to do so because you're lucky enough you get that first tenant who's able to ensure that all the bills are paid and you never really see the need to formalize everything. Well, this evening we'll be exploring why it's so important for you to do just that. Of course, also remember to uh, participate in the competition that we're running. We're not announcing the winner today, but we're announcing the winner next Friday. And all you have to do to enter that competition is to share with us what your property goals and ambitions are. And of course, you share that just here below and you stand a chance of winning one of two 1,000 Rand prizes and we'll be announcing the winner next week. Well, to help us understand why it's so important to run our property like a business and also how we can do that, um, I'm joined this evening by Robin Booth, who is the founder of The Property Booth. Robin, thank you so much for joining us again this evening. Great, excellent, and so good to be here. And you know, when you said it was Friday, and for many people, they say, oh, I'm so glad it's Friday. Well, for many small-scale investors, the weekend is actually just time now to deal with their investments. So it's like they have a full-time job somewhere, and the weekend comes, and it's like, oh, now we have to go and sort out the plumbing and sort out all the hassles. So I'm not quite sure if everyone's going to agree that Friday is the relaxing. Thank goodness it's Friday, because you know, exactly what we're going to talk about tonight, which is even if you're a small-scale investor, there are certain things that we need to be putting in place so that your weekends are your weekends, and that your Christmas and New Year remains your Christmas and New Year, and you're not called out to your properties. And of course, you know, we all have this aspiration of property working for us as opposed to us working for our property. And I think that's what we're really going to be talking about tonight is unlocking those things, whether you haven't even bought a property yet or whether it's your first time investment. It's we need to have that picture of where we're going, what do we need to put in place so that actually our journey there is as, e is as easy as possible, as opposed to one way after six months, you're pulling your hair out, you're stressed and saying, this isn't for me. That's not true. Property can be for everyone as long as you put those things in place and treat it like a business, even if you never have an intention to expand it. Just that mindset of this is an income generating asset for you and your well-being should shift that whole mindset of what do we need to do. And I think, uh, Robin, let's get into it. You know, what are the things that small scale um, investors need to be focusing on? Because uh, oftentimes, you know, we always say if, if, if you take care of the small stuff, the big stuff has a way of taking care of itself. But oftentimes we're not taking care of the small stuff. We're not uh, putting systems in place the time you the day you buy that first rental you know, property. And by the time you get the sixth your admin is in such a bad position that it does feel and seem quite overwhelming. So what are some of the, the very basics we need to be mindful of at the very beginning so that by the time we add that second or third or fourth or fifth rental property, we know that we've got a system in place that, you know, best documents, even processes that we're going to, to be using um, in our investment journey. So we all know that property can create wealth, can create uh, e extra income, it can put your child through university, it can do so much for you. And I think the first thing that we're wanting is to know what your goals are. And what I mean by that is what I call your why. Why do you want property? Why do you want this extra benefit? Because there are going to be those challenging times, whether it's sorting out a difficult tenant, whether it is pacing the streets looking for really good deals, whether it is going from bank to bank to get the best finance for your deal, that, that takes time and it takes effort. 
And if you don't know what your real motivation is, you will give up. So the more that you are clear on what you're wanting the property to give you or do for you, that will be better. And for me, when, you know, when I'm coaching all my students, I start off by saying, put up pictures of what you want your property to bring you. In other words, if you love traveling, put up the destinations of the places that, that you want to go. If you want teen education for your children, put up the schools or the universities that you want them to go to so that when you're at home, you're seeing these goals visibly right in front of you so that you are determined to do what it takes to actually make that work. And I, I want to draw this, this distinction between often people say, you must just do your best. You know, in property investing, I often say, you need to do what it takes, not just your best, because there are times when you have to deal with difficult tenants. There are times when things just don't seem to go your way. And if you understand that the bigger picture is what will get you what you're really wanting, then you'll have that drive and motivation. So first and foremost, know what your goal is. Even if you're just starting small and haven't yet gone out into the big world out there and you haven't even bought your first million or two million, five or 10 million property, you're still just there with the 250 or the 300,000 rand property. This is still the beginning and we need to know where we're going to go, what's going to pull you there. And that is just the first step which everyone should get clear on and actually spend time on really putting in place. So we now know what our why is. You're very clear on the goals that you essentially have um, and you're very clear on how or rather on the things that you want um, your property investment journey to be able to afford you, whether it's opportunities for yourself, opportunities for your family, perhaps even your children or leaving a legacy um, you know, when you're obviously gone. What are now the practical things that certainly as an investor you essentially need to be doing? Because I think it's not enough to just yep. have a why when you still there's still the actual work that needs to go into it. What are some of those, um, you know, things that certainly, particularly small scale investors need to be mindful of at the beginning of their journey? So first and foremost, for me, we need to decide which of the two kinds of investors we're gonna be. Are we gonna be the passive investor or the active investor? The passive investor says, I have a certain amount of money and I wanna invest it in property, but I, wanna, I don't wanna to have to do the sweat work. In other words, I don't wanna to have to do the hard work of, finding properties, managing the properties or any of that, but I want my money to be in property. So that's the passive investor. And the passive investor gives up their control of decision-making of what happens with the property. The second one, which is most likely the group that we're talking to at this moment, is the active investor, which says, I want to make decisions about my properties or about how I spend my money or about the kind of tenants that I want. And therefore I need to make informed decisions. And that means that the responsibility rests more heavily on the active investor. And as we all know, if you're wanting to get the best product or the best result, we need to put in the time and effort. And we've probably already chatted about this a lot of time, which is education. You know, I quickly just Googled that to do an MBA in South Africa, a general MBA will cost about 240,000 Rand. You know, and the purpose of doing an MBA is that you can then go out into the, into the, edu uh, into the career world and actually uh, increase your income so that you can sustain your living. Well, if we're wanting property to do the same, we need to know what we're doing. Whether you're reading books, listening to webcasts like this, uh, speaking to other investors, networking, we need to upskill ourselves. You know, people say, well, coaching's expensive. Well, I've spent over 1.5 million Rand over the last four years on being coached in me getting uh, coaching from people from around the world because I know that without that input, I'm going to make really silly mistakes. Now, I'm certainly not saying everyone must go spend millions of rand on education, but certainly understanding the fundamentals of property will mean you will be confident and empowered, which will mean you when you're uh, talking to an estate agent who might manage your property or you're looking for a bank to actually fund some uh, deals for you, you need to understand what they're referring to. Otherwise, you're going to just accept what they give you. And that will be the first mistake is it won't be on your terms. You'll just accept because you know no better. And that we can't let happen. Now, you know, so Robin, people are, so now we're clear on our why. We certainly are watching the Private Property Podcast. We're on privateproperty.co.za, um, you know, under the advice section and reading up different articles um, that are going to help us in our property journey. But now we want to know how do we make our property work for us. We've already got this property. Um, perhaps we've got a tenant in. How do we actually then actively make this property um, work for us? Because we often want, we often say that you, know, you want your property to work for you as opposed to you working for the property. 
how exactly do we actually go about doing that? So I'm going to challenge some of the assumptions that people say, well, I guess the, the kind of norms out there that people say, you know, location, location, location is the, is the success to property. And I actually feel that there are quite a few ways in which property is going to make you money. Obviously, when you're buying right, when you're managing right, because with effective management, you're going to save more of the money and just give it away. And of course, when you're selling right. So we need to know what's happening in each of those areas so that we can actually control them better, as you were saying, so we can actually get more money out of it. In other words, increase our yields. So first and foremost, let's say, as you mentioned, we have a property now. So again, let's draw the distinction between you're going to hand over the property to an estate agent. And I think we need to spend some time on that alone because there's this belief that the estate agent, one, is going to know more about your property than you, and two, is going to do a better job with your property than you. And somehow we feel okay, well, because they're a professional agency, we just hand it over and we can sit back. And I think that's the first mistake that we're making in that we want to hand over the roles, but we want to make sure that we're still responsible for what they're doing. And I, and I do want to spend some time on that. And of course, the other one is, is how can we ourselves actually put in place those systems that actually make it work? And because we're talking about business, we all know that business has specific systems, which regardless of what business you're in are all following the same principles. The fact that we need to know our numbers, we need to have management uh, finances come through. We want to know what our uh, expenses are. We want to know what our income is. We want to know that we've got all the record keeping in place because SARS, our revenue service is getting smarter and smarter at tracking all these things. They're starting to ring fence. And we're very grateful that, <laughs> we're very grateful right? that you are, but often it's to the detriment of somebody whose admin isn't particularly well. I actually want to pick up on, um, you know, something that you've just mentioned there, Robin, around putting in systems um, and certainly that even businesses are run on systems. So certainly as a small scale property investor, what are those systems that we should be putting in place? As I can imagine as somebody who, you know, maybe you've recently just bought a property or you're even looking at buying. I mean, you're certainly watching this podcast uh, quite regularly, picking up different tips and you're thinking, okay, so they're talking about systems. I know that there are systems in, you know, the organization that I work for. And those systems sometimes are often governed and run by other people. I'm just a small player in making sure that the system keeps running. But when you talk about systems in, in the context of your property portfolio or running your property portfolio, managing your property portfolio like a business, what exactly do we mean? Because I'm sure I mean, between you and I, we're quite clear because we're now in it. Um, and we've put in those systems in place, but certainly not every viewer at home. I know when I started off, I certainly didn't know what some of those systems are. So when we talk about those systems, what exactly are we referring to? So let's take again that, that most of your listeners here are the more active investor, have one or two properties, and they are managing themselves, right? So first of all, knowing that you have a good lease and what the clauses are on your lease. My lease is 26 pages and it takes me about half an hour to read through it. But I need to know what it says there because it's a legally binding contract. And I often say, if you're a landlord, you either have been taken to the CMA or you'll be you know, to the rental housing tribunal or you will end up going at some point in your time. So I'm saying prepare for what is going to happen, which is you are a professional. If you're renting your place out to a tenant, you are a professional property investor, which means you need to be responsible in knowing what you're putting out there. So first and foremost, read through your lease again and again to ensure you've got it, because I promise you your tenant is unlikely to ask you what they all mean. They're probably just gonna sign because they're saying, well, you should know what you're doing. So first and foremost is that one. The second one is really under the system is understanding how to track your income. There's no point in you just signing a lease and not knowing what money's coming in, when it's coming in. And if you take this seriously and your lease says that the rent should be in on the first of every month, then make sure you are checking because your tenant will not take this seriously if you do not take it seriously. So there's nothing like on the first day, if it's not in and you send your tenant a letter to say, hey, you are in breach of our lease, to have that tenant wake up and say, this landlord is serious. Whether you have one property or not, that relationship shifts to a professional level. And I promise you, you will have less hassles than um, in any other situation. While we're talking about that, I want to add in, for me, 
the best thing to do is to never say you own the property. Say that you are the director of the company or a trustee who's managing it because it creates a distance between you and your tenant. So if the tenant tries to negotiate with you and says, oh, hi, Mr. or Ms. Landlord, please, can I get this? Or can, I, can you discount the rent this way? Instead of you feeling awkward and saying, well, I don't know because it's so difficult, you can just say, well, I'll take this to the board of trustees and I'll be able to come back to you with a response. And then you can just come back and say, oh, the trustees said we cannot discount the rent further. And now your relationship is still good with them. It just creates that distance. These small little things will totally transform how you manage your property. So I hope that's a good example. It's such a great example. I actually have a friend who does exactly that. Uh, he does property management. And, and I remember the first time I heard him speak of it like that. He was speaking to somebody else, but I knew he was referring to himself. But he was essentially saying, you know, uh, you know we'll I'll speak to the directors and we'll come back to you about, you know, what the decision is. And it was quite mind-blowing because I thought, well, I know you're the managing director and this is your business. And, and yet you're speaking to the, other to the other party as though there's still a boardroom filled with people that you must still consult about this particular thing. It certainly does, um, when you're the person on the receiving end, make you think slightly differently that, oh, okay, this isn't just a one-man show. Uh, because even if it is a one-man show, it's not to discount the work that you're doing and the hours that you're putting in, um, in building that portfolio. And it could even scale and end up being 50 different, you know, properties that you're managing and we can still essentially be that one-man show. Robin, we're going to take a quick break and when we come back, we're going to be looking at, you know, some of the other things that um, certainly small-scale investors need to be doing. And I also want us to, to, to look at you know, how we then begin to scale um, our portfolio. Because I think one of the things is when you get, as we're saying, some of the fundamentals um, very well in the early stages, it's easy for you to then scale um, your portfolio, especially when we look at uh, working with the banks. So I'd like to give us our viewers certainly tips around why it's important to make sure that you do the right things first, in the beginning and put in those systems as Robin has um, highlighted in the beginning so that by the time you want to speak to the bank um, in scaling your portfolio, you're able to have a more professional conversation with them and you're able to essentially show them what your track record is. We're going to take a quick break and when we come back, I'll still be speaking to Robin Booth and we'll be talking about managing your property like an investor or rather like a business and we're giving tips to small scale investors. We're going to be back just after this. to episode 45 of the Private Property Podcast. I'm your host, Uzamantu Kumalo. This evening, we're talking about managing your property like a business, tips for small-scale investors. And I'm joined by Robin Booth, who is the founder of the Property Booth. Now, Robin, you know, we're quickly saying off air that you actually had a story that you wanted to quickly share with our viewers around systems and how, you know, you are nearly charged an arm, a leg, and a liver for your electricity consumption. Can you share that with us? Yes, sure. So we had a situation where we had a property and uh, we were very diligent with the property in that we were taking uh, weekly readings of the amount of electricity that we were using. And I suggest most investors should at least do their own reading every month or two months. But what happened is, is the actual meter reading had ticked over. So it went from 99,999 back to zero as some of the old meters did. So council saw that there was a 99,999 difference of units and therefore they calculated my um, electricity, electricity usage and actually charged me 1.5 million Rand. 
And when I phoned them and said, listen, I understand where the error is. They just said, well, we'll send someone to check it. And they came back and said, the reading is correct. Well, it is correct because it had checked back to zero, zero, zero. And you know, the thing about the council is they had said to me that they will only process my request if I paid 50% of what I owed. So I said, you want me to pay 750,000 Rand for one month's error of electricity? Yeah. And then I actually sent them my records. And only because of that did they actually, could they see what it is. So here again, classic scenario. And again, actually, let's just talk about that because we're in COVID at the moment and our electricity and water has not been read. They are estimates. What's going to happen for those of you listening who perhaps had a leak that started two months ago and has been running out and no one knows because you're not getting the bill and there's no insight. That it crush you because council will come and say if the leak is on your side of the meter on your property you're at fault so what are you doing to check that there are actually leaks or that um there's a, a, a high usage these are all the systems that we can actually get our tenants to do we can actually ask them to every month give us the meter readings and we just very quickly can just keep tracking so that we know nothing gets out of hand remember everything that we control will enable us to increase our yields, will enable us to keep more of that money. And that's again, just a real example of, of knowing what is going on. <laughs> a rather scary situation. Look, I, I can't imagine being, uh, you know, built <laughs> over a million rand for a month's worth of electricity. I, I don't know how the person even on the other end, but I suppose it's also system generated, but I'm sure as you, you know, start to inquire, I'm pretty sure that certainly the person on the other end also can't fathom you know, how any household, it doesn't even matter how many people you end up putting in there, can rack up an electricity bill to, to, to that amount. But you know, so one of the things that I actually wanted to talk about is certainly a lot of us who start off with us with one or two properties, you certainly want to get to a point where you're able to buy more um, and you want to obviously be able to confidently go to the bank and have a conversation about them extending you um, another line of credit to, to get that particular uh, home loan. Why is it so important then, or how rather can you know, small scale investors ensure that when they're running that one or two apartment um, or maybe even house, that they put in the right systems? What kind of systems should they be putting in that are going to help them when they then go to the bank and ask for that third home loan and essentially even use income from obviously both those particular properties or one if you own one to make their case because i think so many of us probably don't know how to best navigate you know conversations with the bank um can be quite intimidating and i think that's part partly why you know a lot of the conversations that we've had with amsa have been so welcomed by our viewers because we often just so intimidated by the bank and we don't know where to start. So what are the systems or things that we should put in place that's going to help us when we start having that conversation with the banks? So perhaps the best way to answer that is to imagine yourself as the bank looking at yourself saying, well, do I want to lend this person money? So if we're realizing that the bank is going to make a decision based on the finances and the ability for you to repay that loan, and is that loan secured by enough property, not enough equity in the property to make it worthwhile? And if we realize that and listen to this carefully is that I, I checked with ABSA just a month and a half ago, I said, how long does a credit um, approver take a look at your finances to make a decision on whether it's approved or not? It's two minutes, right? They're going to basically just look to see what has been presented to them and hopefully through some originator or someone who's been able to collate it. But these are decisions that are made very quickly. So you need to make sure that all of, all of your figures and your finances demonstrate that you know what you're doing and that your finances are in place. You know, banks are asking for audited financial statements. They're looking for a monthly management accounts. You know, they're not saying just give us, you know, at the end of a year, uh, quickly try and tally up all your details and see how much money you're making. They want to know that you are on top of your game. So we need to be learning that as we go along and ensure our systems are in place. Systems such as that your bank feeds are imported perhaps automatically into a program so that it's all actually done automatically without you having to sit there in a spreadsheet and cross calculate. You know, modern technology is fantastic in that it gives us such power over, over actually managing our finances correctly from that perspective. And of course, all those other things, because the more we can motivate and show that we're uh, 
doing things and they're in place, the more the banks are going to say, we can trust this person because you can see that they're on top of, of what they're doing. I think that's really important. And for those that are starting, I suggest you even start that now, even before you have found a property, because wow, what a, what a challenge it is if you're becoming emotionally attached to a property that you see and you get so excited about, and then there's this long process of, oh, I have to collate my forms and my my, my tax forms and my management accounts, and then you lose it and you feel so you know, demoralized. Start now, go and see if you can get pre-approved. Have a look at your credit score. How can you repair your credit? You know, I know in your private property has a lot of information on your website about repairing credit, improving credit. Get to know what you need to do now so that when the deal comes, you're so ready for it. And that's the best way to start scaling. And you know what, I must say that, that I've actually also had that particular challenge. Uh, I'm not the biggest fan of admin. And, and I remember there was a time when I was adding more properties to my portfolio and I had to um, get different forms in place. I needed to do my balance sheet. I hadn't automated my balance sheet. So I had to you know, physically and manually sit down and have it done. And, and there was nothing my banker could do to help because I had to provide that information to them. And if anything, it also just emphasized the importance of getting into a system of tracking you know, income and expenses so that when I find that you know, deal, I'm not wasting time still having to do a balance sheet and trying to do it for like the past three or six months so that you can make a business case um, to the bank about it. And it really is something that we often don't think about, especially the more you know, properties you kind of get, you kind of think, ah, I'll eventually get to sorting out my admin, but you never do. And and, and I'm quite guilty um, of that one. We've got a, a comment here coming in, a question and a comment coming in from uh, Shagong, Shagong who, uh, who says, thank you for bringing up SARS. I began investing in property a few years ago before I educated myself about structures. So I ended up buying in my own name. I have recently come across a unit that I would like to buy in a company. My question then is, do companies also have a tax season like um, pays you earn tax payers? I need to determine how soon I would be able to repay the funds. Should I raise transfer and registration costs through a personal loan or a rich uncle somewhere that I then loan to the company? So there are a lot of um, people who will give possibly varying responses to that one. At the moment, a lot of people are definitely suggesting buying a company because it also limits some of your liability in that and it keeps it in the property or in the company. Um, and then they can say either a trust is holding the shares of the company or perhaps you can also hold those yourself. But really what we want to do is twofold is we want to first make sure that our assets are protected and then we want to look for tax efficiency and see how to really make that work. Because sometimes people just keep focusing on how can I save money and not pay the tax man as much and then they're actually not understanding that property is the long-term gain and we want to make both of those work for us. So within the property, most certainly you can, even if it's a new, uh, a new company, you can still as a director, uh, take out finance for that property within that company. And that is very much what people are doing at the moment. We do know that um, SARS is targeting trusts. At the same time, a lot of our ministers have trusts. So we do know that even within SARS, there still is a reluctance just to say, well, trusts are not a good thing. But as always, we want to have on our team the tax specialists and the structure specialists who can actually advise us on the detail. And I think first and foremost, again, we need to say, I'm certainly not the, the tax advisor here, but I'm saying I've got a team around me who I'm continuously asking, if I do this, if I do that, like I mentioned, they're starting to ring fence more and more properties and saying, even within a company or a trust as well, that even though the expenses, even though it's, it's an expense in the company or trust, and it's not related to that specific property, you can't offset the income from that property with that expense. And that was quite a, that's quite a big eye opener because in the past we could. So again, we need to keep ourselves updated um, as to what's going on. And we certainly have been promising that we're going to have a conversation, uh, two different conversations actually, one around tax, because uh, I think a lot of property investors always have questions around tax. I don't do my own taxes. I have an accountant who does them. I've been getting audited every year by SARS and my audits are always clean. I always manage to get quite a substantial amount of money back from SARS. And that's because I have a professional who handles 
uh, my taxes and does them efficiently and effectively. So it is, of course, important to, to have that power team. Um, and it's something that we emphasize that you don't do property alone. You certainly have different people who help you on your journey, especially as you start adding more and more properties. Another question, this one coming in from one of our regular viewers, good boy, who asks, would it be helpful to open a business bank account for only your property or is that not possible? So most certainly possible, and I would actually recommend that the more you treating this as a business and the more you can actually see all the income and expenses more clearly as a business, it will just make so much more sense for you in the long run. It's kind of like paving the way for you to add more onto that. In your mind, you're already starting to transform how you see your property, how you see the possible possibility of adding more properties from the bank's perspective that can also see your um, you're actually laying that out in, in that way. And, you know, opening up bank accounts are, are, are reasonable. It's not like this is opening up a massive structure. It's just a bank account. And I think definitely I would suggest that. Uh, and it's a good way to go forward with that. Uh, another one of our regulars asking, and this time around, it's Bonds Sabakwena, who says, Robin Booth, Mr. Airbnb. My question is, how do you choose a property for Airbnb? Uh, what do you look out for? I know we're going to actually invite you for a very separate conversation that come, when it comes to Airbnb. Uh, and, and I know that a lot of Airbnb owners are probably in quite a predicament right now because of the effects of COVID. But I actually want us to invite you back on to talk specifically about that. But let's address uh, Bongs' question, you know, how do you choose an Airbnb property? So there are a couple of ways to choose it. And the first way that I like to do it is I'm going to cross reference with one of the um, property websites out there. And I'll tell you what the name is. It's Air DNA. So Air as an Airbnb, but DNA, D for David, uh, N for Nelly, A for Apple, A DNA. And in that you can actually enter the address of a property and it will tell you what the predicted uh, income will be for that property. So that takes a whole lot of the guessing out of the, um, you know, out of the equation. So that's a secret I, I don't tell a lot of people because that's part of the magic. Right? People kind of think, well, it's a hit and miss. No ways. There's nothing hit and miss about property investing. We want to know our numbers. We want to buy right, rent right all those things. So that property, that website will actually tell you, it takes the surrounding Airbnbs in the area and actually calculates what's the day rate you could expect, the occupancy rate and your annual income if you ran that on Airbnb. And it's accurate because I cross-reference that with my own properties and realize, wow, well, actually they're doing a good job. So that's the best way. And again, it doesn't have to be in a tourist area. It doesn't have to be in a fancy um, environment. Airbnb works all over and we will chat about this I'm sure later on you know I've still had uh, about an 85 to 95 percent occupation rate in my units during lockdown and even now and while still within the criteria of level three four and five so it can be done we just need to know the right strategies and of course I think a lot of people out here at the moment listening are saying well you know how can we change that so let's get on to that sometime soon. Another question here, Robin, this one coming in from Ramiz Hassan, uh, who asks, do you have to open a separate trust for each property you rent out? And what is the best way to keep track of each property? So you do not have to open up a new company or a new trust for each property. Uh, and I definitely wouldn't suggest you do that unless your property is big. In other words, probably yeah, over 50 that, people. That has like 50 people right? living because it costs a lot to keep that going. In a trust, you need to do your financials and that alone is gonna cost between seven and 10,000 Rand. So, and that's annual, right, every year. So I, I would prefer that one starts that small, you can do it in a company, get it going. And my, my rule of thumb is four to five and then you open up another one because we also wanna limit the liability within that company so that uh, as we're expanding, we're actually not just putting all our eggs into one basket. So I'll definitely open up different ones from that perspective. And that second question that he had was, how do you keep track or what is the best way rather to keep track of each property? So to keep track uh, from in my case, I, in my accounting system, I have what we call cost centers. In other words, there'll be properties so that each item is allocated to that actual property. So at a push of a button, I can actually see all the, the rental income, all the expenses, all the bank charges, everything as it collates into that uh, one property. So 
again, it's what the systems that you're putting in place on how to manage that is going to be really important. And it can actually be done really automatically. Like I can say, if you see rent coming from um, John Shapiro, allocate that to this property and it does it all automatically without me even having to do that. I mean, that's what I love about technology is it transforms the individual investor like myself who wants to manage a lot of properties that I can actually do that without having to get trapped in it. And I think that's the game changer we're seeing with tech at the moment. Robin, before I let you go, any tips, uh, you know, what would be your three top tips for uh, small scale investors when it comes to running their properties or their property portfolio like a business? So I have, I have a one which, which continuously drives me, which is understand the difference between creating your own tension or tension will find you. And what I mean by that is, at this moment, some of you listening might be saying, okay, I need to set up the system correctly. I'm going to put in place meter reading. I'm going to put in place all these different things. That is you saying to yourself, I would like to step up to actually take action on these things that will improve me as a property investor. That is creating your own tension because it becomes uncomfortable for you. It takes effort. If you don't do that, Tension will find you because you're going to be taken to the rental housing tribunal. You're going to have leaks. You're going to have counsel telling you, telling um, you, you owe a lot of money and suddenly you've got tension that, that's finding you. And I think that's going to totally differentiate you from being the professional property investor, as opposed to the investor out there who just doesn't really know what's going on and will say, well, property doesn't really work for me. And I'm like, well, it won't until you actually get everything in place. So definitely create your own tension. Robin, we're going to leave it there this evening. Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you very much. And that is Robin Booth, who is the founder of the Property Booth. And that's it for this evening's rendition of the Private Property Podcast. It's a weekend. Uh, I don't know if it makes any of a difference to many of you at home. Uh, of course, if you've missed any of our episodes, you're able to either watch them right here on Facebook or watch them on our YouTube channel. So all you have to do is search for private property on YouTube and catch up on some of the old episodes that you have missed. That's it for us this evening. You do not want to miss Monday's show. We're going to have quite a surprise. I don't want to ruin it just yet. And of course, if you're missing us this weekend, you can watch Monday's show who will be uh, giving you this week's rendition of the developer's show. So on Saturday and Sunday, you can watch the developer's show where you can you know see some of the best estates that the country has to offer and one of the you know one of the features that some of those estates have and of course that is on saturday and sunday with umandisa if anything it's one of those things that you might perhaps even want to put on your vision board uh, and maybe start viewing the moment we're able to to go to physical viewings of those particular estates folks that's it for me this evening we're going to be back on monday at seven o'clock until then stay home and stay safe Hi, I'm Clifton Smithers. I live in Belito, where my partners and I run a business called Union 3. As a family, we chose to move here about six years ago. What attracted us to the area was the safe and relaxed lifestyle of the North Coast. We're surrounded by so much natural beauty, and we love that it's so casual. It's just not as intense as a busy city. In fact, that's one of the main reasons there's so many people moving into the area. There's some amazing lifestyle estates out here. We've got some Bali, Bretton Wood Estate, and Zimbiti to name a few. The Belito Lifestyle Center caters to everyone's needs. There's also some smaller commercial centers like Tiffany's in Salt Rock. There's some excellent restaurants to choose from, and there's a really wide variety of activities on offer. From mountain biking out on the trails to surfing at any one of the beaches, there really is something for everyone. This quiet little town really comes alive over the weekend. The live concerts in the farmer's market at the Leachy Orchard is very popular. With the new international airport just 15 minutes down the road and the unmatched lifestyle that this place offers, it's no wonder that the North Coast is the fastest growing town in South Africa. My family and I absolutely love it, here, and this is our neighbor.
Hi, I'm Nicolene Terblanche and I'm part of the SA Women's Hockey Team and I'm the Technical Director of Tax Hockey and I'm also the Assistant Coach for the first two years. I moved to Ferry Glen about five years ago. Ferry Glen is a really safe place and the people are really kind. Some of my friends live really close by in suburbs like Equestria and Olympus. In the morning I will wake up, make myself a cup of coffee, go for a jog in the Ferry Glen Nature Reserve or even just in the neighborhood. It's safe, quiet, and the environment is really nice. I love Ferry Glen because I'm near the city, but I'm not in the city. I like to go to Pretoria Country Club clear my mind, um, on my own, to relax and just to enjoy a round of golf. In Pretoria East we really have nice uh, places to visit like Menland Mall and Brooklyn Mall that is really close by. There are also a lot of top schools in the area like Pretoria Boys High and Yoshko Menlo Park. One of the most beautiful places to see the whole of Pretoria is the Fort Tapperkop viewpoint. And that's my neighborhood. 